Praise the Lord. God is good all the time. Amen. God truly is very, very good. Even in all these difficult times, He is rejoicing over us with singing, as we heard in the pre-service prayer. So let's continue with the Beatitudes. I'm on the very last Beatitude today, which is the eighth. There are eight attitudes of the kingdom. Uh, so this is the, from the greatest sermon ever told, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And so I've been through the first seven attitudes. And the last one is more of a, not really an attitude. We're, we're to have an attitude in the midst of it, but it's something that will happen because of the seven attitudes that we have. And it, I call it the P word. And it's a word, I, I say this because usually we say the something word because it's something, a word you don't want to hear. <laughs> and this is a word that as Christians we don't like to hear, the word persecution. You know, there's other P words that we prefer, like prosperity. Do you know that persecution and words associated with persecution in the New Testament is used 42 times? Prosperity the word just used three times. So there is something about not just persecution, but the whole theme of suffering that permeates the New Testament. And prosperity, yes, it's there, but it's in the context of persecution. And we must understand that. That's a very important thing to understand. So as we read through, let's read through again these eight Beatitudes. These are qualities God wants us to have, the attitudes God wants us to have, and the last one is the result of, of those attitudes. So let's read together from the top. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word that it's sharper and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, and it pierces through our thoughts and intentions. It speaks deep into our hearts to bring transformation. It's like a surgeon's sword cuts into our life and brings healing and restoration into our lives. So Lord, use this word, Lord, powerfully embed it in our hearts and bring transformation in our lives, in our families, in this church. We bless your name, Lord God. Speak to us even about this difficult topic of persecution, Lord God. Help us to really rise up and realize that in the midst of persecution, there's a greater P word, and Lord, we'll be looking at what that is. Show us, Lord, the truth of what it is to really be, be in, head over heels in love with you. That we can even go through difficult times such as persecution. In the mighty name of Jesus, we ask and pray. And all the people of God said, Amen. So this is the diagram that we have been seeing. That there's internal attitudes, external attitudes that Jesus is giving to his disciples. It's really, when Jesus is teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, it's primarily for his disciples that they may be matured through these attitudes. He's teaching them how to live in God's kingdom in a powerful way so that they can be kingdom people. It's like his kingdom manifesto. And so the internal attitudes are to be poor in spirit, to mourn, to be meek, to be hungry and thirsty after righteousness. And these will lead to external actions in our life. That is, we will start to reach out in mercy, acts of mercy to other people. And these acts will be out of a pure heart. They will not be with the wrong motives and intentions because we have the other attitudes. And it will all be to make us as peacemakers in this world. Of course, the greatest peace is to bring the Prince of Peace into people's lives. That's to share the good news of Jesus into people's lives so that they receive him as their Lord and their Savior. So all of these attitudes actually are leading us to be humble, that is to recognize we, we need God, and in humility we repent and mourn over our own sins so that we can be cleansed 
and so that we can be cleansed, so we can be a channel to do his will, to be meek. That means to submit to the will of God and align our life with his will and his destiny. And then we will be hungry and thirsty to do what is right, to do his righteous ways and to be righteous in his righteousness. And as we do those things, we will reach out in mercy to others. That will be the product. Definitely, we will start to do acts of mercy to other people with a pure heart, and we will be peacemakers, that is, sharing the good news, sharing the gospel. But as we do all of those seven things, those seven attitudes, seven is the number of perfection, so if we want to mature to be perfect like Christ, then we must have these attitudes, because Jesus had these attitudes. But what will be the result? The P word. (laughs) Persecution. Persecution will come. There will be persecution if we have these attitudes. Because these attitudes will stir up the spirit of Antichrist. And the spirit of Antichrist wants to persecute God's people. Majority will receive. There will be a majority of those that will be receiving the word of God and the peace into their hearts. But there's a small minority that will actually get more and more and more until the Antichrist is fully revealed. And then there's a tipping point. And there will be even more persecutions that come. So if you look at each one of these, most of these beatitudes are what what I call oxymorons. You know what oxymoron is? It's like Arnold Schwarzenegger's film, True Lies. How can you have true lies? They contradict one another. In the same way, these seem to contradict the poor. Blessed are the poor. The poor are going to be blessed. Those that mourn are going to be blessed. All the way until those that are persecuted are going to be blessed. It doesn't seem to make sense. But in God's kingdom, it does make sense. God's kingdom is an upside down kingdom. And so he wants us to understand that. And so the whole purpose of the Beatitudes is so that we can be filled with the spirit of Jesus of Christ. And we can reach out and share the good news to others. Amen. With the right attitude. And as we do that, there will come persecution. Acts 1.8, anyone know what Acts 1.8 says? It says that you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Do you know that the word there, witnesses, is the Greek word marturio? And that's the word where we get martyr from in the English language. Because as they were his witnesses, what was happening? There was persecution that came, especially from the the religious authorities. And there were, in fact, when Jesus was speaking this to the disciples, most of the disciples were martyred eventually for their faith. There was only Judas, of course, who hanged himself because he betrayed Jesus. But the, the other disciples, they all died for their faith. And they were martyred, except for John, the apostle John. No one knows exactly what happened to him. He, he seemed to have died in his old age, but he also suffered a lot. He was exiled on the island of Patmos, and tradition says they tried to boil him alive, but they could not kill him, so they put him on the island of Patmos. I don't know if that's true or not. So he also suffered a lot of things. But in the midst of all that suffering, they knew great joy. They knew great witness. They were witnesses to the Lord. So the Lord wants to make us a witness for him, which means that some of us may become martyrs. Not all of us, but some may become martyrs for the Lord. And especially as the spirit of Antichrist is revealed more and more and more. You see that the the Apostle John talks about there are many Antichrists that have even gone out right now. You know, those that hear the gospel message and they get angry and even want to persecute, even want to kill. That's making martyrs of Christians. Of course, the scripture shows that there will be martyrs, but we are not to seek martyrdom. We're not to, you know, and some of the early Christian uh, monks, they actually went out seeking to be martyred because they thought they had greater reward if they, they were going to be martyred. It doesn't say that in scripture. It says that there may come a time that we have to face martyrdom. And so, you know, that could be the end product of this putting your hands in in chains. 
So let's read out the whole part of the last, because we just read out the first part of the last beatitude, but actually has more to it. In Matthew 5, 10 to 12, let's read this together. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven for the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So here, in fact, it's the only, as I said before at the beginning, it's the only beatitude that has two blessings to it. Okay, so actually there's nine times the word blessed is used, makarios. But two of those times is to do with the very last beatitude, which is blessed are those who are persecuted. Why? Because there's a double portion of blessing for those who go through persecution. Though You know, when we have those other seven attitudes, we love the Lord so much, we go out and share Him. Yes, there will rise up people who who are manipulated by the spirit of Antichrist who will persecute us, but we have a double blessing. And the word blessing literally means joy, happy. We'll be full of joy and happiness. And when you read the testimonies of, through history, church history, of those that are martyred or are persecuted for the sake of the gospel, There's a joy that is in their life. Remember when Stephen was being stoned to death? They looked at him and he had like a face of an angel. And he he saw the heaven open up and he saw the Lord Jesus sitting on the right hand of the Father. And there was such a peace and a joy that was upon his life during that time when he was being martyred. And so it's a double portion that is for those that are persecuted. What is the definition of persecution? It comes from the word dioko, which means to pursue or to chase. Literally refers to the result of the pursuing. So because we're sharing the good news of Jesus, because we're shining for the Lord Jesus, there are some that can't take that because the spirit of Antichrist rebels against this. And they will pursue and chase after you, even to the point of violence and sometimes to the point of death. So it's the hatred and affliction that follows the witness and holy life of God's people in a hostile world. There's one story that I heard, which is an example of the most extreme form of persecution. In 1900, how many have heard of the Boxer Rebellion in China? Okay, it's when there were insurgents that came up and the Chinese people rose up, against, especially against Western influences in China. And there's one story in 1900 where they had surrounded, the insurgents had surrounded a mission station where there were many mission students, 100 mission students were there, who all Chinese, learning the, the Bible. Uh, but the insurgents surrounded with guns and they blocked off all of the gates and they only allowed one gate to be open. And at the foot of that gate, they placed a picture of a cross on the floor. And they went in and they said, and they passed around the message, anybody who goes out and tramples on the cross and denies the Lord Jesus, you trample on the cross, then you will be spared the firing squad. But if you don't trample on the cross, then you will be facing the firing squad and will die. And so that word went around. And at first there were seven of the young students who went out and they, with their heads hung in shame, they trampled over the cross and they were spared. But then there was an eighth girl who went and as she went up to the cross, she fell down on her knees before the cross and she cried out to the Lord for strength to go through the persecution. And she cried out with tears in her eyes and then she got up and she, instead of walking over the cross, she just walked around the cross and they took her to the firing squad and killed her. But it strengthened all of the other 92 who were watching on. And so all of the others did the same that she did. They all fell down before the cross and they went and they were all shot for their witness to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a very sobering tale when we hear that. That was in 1900, but even today there are people facing similar situations to that. What would be your response in that situation? I ask myself that, what would my response be? I really don't know. All I can say is that from stories you hear about those that go through that, there's a special grace that comes upon these people. 
And I just want to be in that place where I'm ready not to deny my Lord, where I'm ready to say whatever. I will never, ever trample the cross. I will always bow down and worship the Lord and my Savior. In Matthew 23, verse 34, it says, Therefore I send you prophets, wise men, scribes, some of whom you will kill. And Jesus here is talking to the Pharisees, the religious leaders, and you will crucify. Some you will flog in your synagogues and persecute from town to town. So here you see there's certain levels of persecution. There are those that will be killed. That's the martyrs. We're not to seek martyrdom, but there will be those that are martyred for their faith. And then you will flog in the synagogues. There are those that will suffer physically and other, in other forms. And those persecuted from town to town, other forms of persecution. So what we want to look at is that there's degrees of persecution. There's what are called normal, moderate, and severe degrees of persecution. And I think that in this room, probably none of us have experienced more than just the normal persecution. <laughs> Praise the Lord, because Singapore is actually a safe, religious, tolerant nation. So normal persecution is, as it says here, there's, when you become a Christian, then you start to share your faith with others. You'll be ridiculed, reviled, disapproval, harassment, mockery, jeers, slander, maligned, pressure to conform, shunning, bullying, mistreatment, labeling, loss of friends, ignored, hatred, prejudice, all of these things. That's normal. That's a normal Christian life. If you love the Lord Jesus Christ and you share him, these things will happen. When I first became a Christian and I loved the Lord and I went and told my friends about Jesus, some accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, others rejected, and I lost a few friends during that time. And then at school, I remember the word got out, I'd become a Christian. Even one of the teachers teachers started to speak against Christianity. He was an atheist. And in his classroom, he took every opportunity to bring in things against Christianity. <laughs> so all of that, and that was directed at me being a Christian. And I remember even, uh, even until recently in my, my parents' 50th wedding anniversary, we went back to England. And there's one auntie that constantly, when she heard that I was, went into missions, then I went to become a pastor. She would, every time we'd meet up, she says, so do you enjoy uh, hurting your parents by going into this kind of work? She would say things like this, and she would say, uh, when are you going to get a proper job? The 50th wedding anniversary, she came up to me. Now I'm working as a pastor in this church. She came up to me and said, so I still hear you've, you've not got a proper job. <laughs> to her, a pastor is not a proper job. You know, so there's this, and this is, this is just normal persecution that all of us need to endure. And we shall see we endure in a certain attitude with a certain attitude. There's moderate persecution, which are... So the first one is more social, social persecution. And here, if you come from you know, maybe families with other religions, you will have this form of persecution when you decide to invite Jesus into your heart, you become a Christian. There's moderate persecution, which is more can affect even finances. And this can even come through the legal system. There's threats, legal prohibitions, economic sanctions, loss of educational opportunities, loss of employment, uh, loss of property, vandalism, physical abuse, false accusations, harassment. Even in the West, you're starting to see this creep into society. There are people who are losing their jobs because they're a Christian. There are Christian professors who refuse to believe in in the form of evolution that is being taught in the university. And because of that, they're considered not true scientists. And so they lose their job. There are people who've lost their job. There's a nurse I heard lost her job because she was praying for one of the patients. There's an air stewardess lost her job because she refused to take off a cross that she was wearing. And this is creeping in even into what we call civilized modern cultures. Okay, so... We can't think that we're so far away from this. Praise the Lord, at the moment, most of us would have experienced normal. Moderate, the only time I've experienced moderate is when I was on a mission trip. I won't say which country, but I, we were in one country, and we went to share from village to village the gospel. And as we were sharing, people were receiving and people were becoming, coming to Christ. But after a few days, uh, in one village where we were, there was a group of men came to us 
we were just, there was a group of us, us uh, and we were going house to house. This group of men came, and they had stones in their hands, and they started to throw, they started to stone us. Uh, we heard later that they were very kind to us, because they were aiming at our feet. If they were really stoning us properly, we, we would have, you know, ended up in hospital or even died. That's the worst kind of persecution that I've experienced as a Christian. <laughs> and severe is, of course, that which probably leads to death. So kidnapping, forced labor, slavery, forced conversion, imprisonment, re-education camp, physical torture, beatings, flogging. So all of these are the most severe forms of persecution. And you'll be very surprised at the statistics today. Now, I always used to think the early church had it very much worse than we do today. Is that true? It's not true at all. Do you know that since the death of Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago, there's an estimated 43 million Christians have been martyred, have died for their faith. Over 50% of those 43 million were in the last 100 years. Can you take that in? Now, when we read about all the stories of the Roman persecutions of the early church, you see the pictures of the Roman uh, theater, amphitheater, where the lions are going to, to kill the Christians. That's nothing compared to what's happening today in terms of numbers of people who are being martyred for their faith. Each month, this is according to Open Doors, Open Doors Missionary Organization, each month, 28 million Christians experience high levels of persecution and discrimination. 322 Christians are killed for their faith every month. 214 churches and Christian properties are destroyed. 772 forms of violence are committed against Christians. And we in Singapore are very shielded from this. And thank God for that. But we must realize there are brothers and sisters in Christ around the world who are suffering great things. Even right now, there are people being persecuted for their faith. There are people dying for their faith, even right now. And according to Scripture, this is going to get worse. In the end times, when the time of the Great Tribulation, there's going to be martyrdoms and persecution like the world has never, ever seen before. And so we need to be preparing ourselves for that. Now, if the Lord come and raptures us before all of that happens, then praise the Lord. As if you went through my course on Revelation, you see I don't believe that because I don't see Scripture clearly teaches that. I see that it seems to be that we will have to go through, or at least Christians alive at that time will have to go through that tribulation. But God promises that there's a double blessing, double rewards for those who are persecuted for their faith. And not only that, there's a great joy. The word blessing, as I said before, there's a great uh, joy and happiness that comes if we endure persecution. Praise the Lord, I don't believe most will experience martyrdom, and most of us will not experience dramatic, severe persecutions. But all of us, if we really want to live godly lives, we will suffer some form of persecution. That's what the scriptures say. So, there's three G's I want to look at about persecution. Firstly, persecution is a given. It's a given. In other words, if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you're a real believer and you're growing in the Lord, you will suffer some form of persecution. That's what Paul said to Timothy. 2 Timothy 3.12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall, what? suffer persecution. It doesn't say may do, some of them will do, or that live godly or choose to live godly in some translations. Those that desire to live godly lives will suffer persecution. So those that live in the Beatitudes, live in the attitudes that Jesus is saying, that will bring true happiness and true satisfaction into our life and cause us to be his kingdom people, we will experience some form of persecution. Jesus promised persecution would be the result of following him. There's one very surprising thing Jesus said in Matthew 10, 34 to 39. This is where Jesus said, don't think I came to bring peace on earth. What did he say? I came to bring a sword. 
I came to divide parents from children. I came to divide people from people. Now, was Jesus here saying that, you know, he's, he's coming to destroy families? No. What he, because if you, if you read in the whole context of Scripture, especially in the book of Acts, you see whole families coming to know the Lord, coming into to be part of the church. What Jesus was saying here is that as we love him and we follow him, there will be the spirit of Antichrist that rises up, even within families, and bring persecution. There will be even parents who will disown their own children because they become Christians. He said, don't think I came to bring peace on earth. Where did, come, where did Jesus come to bring peace? When the angels rejoiced, when Jesus was born, it said, peace on earth, goodwill to all men. So why does Jesus say here he didn't come to bring peace on earth? What he was talking about is the age that we're in now. Jesus ultimately comes to bring peace on earth in the millennium when Jesus returns. It's the time of great peace where the saints will be ruling and reigning with him. Jerusalem will be the capital right at the center. Jesus will be there coordinating all things and bringing the peace of the Lord over the whole earth. But now he's not come to bring peace on earth because it's only going to get more and more violent on the earth before Jesus returns. That's what Revelation shows us. Is there's going to be more and more lack of peace upon the earth. But he comes to bring peace in the hearts of people. Amen? And as Christians, if we receive that peace through demonstrating these attitudes, then we can give that peace to others around us. We can be the light, the salt of the earth and the light of the world, which will be my next message, continuing the Sermon on the Mount. And as we are those things, as we are salt and light and bring peace into other people's hearts, yes, the earth may experience turmoil and tri trials and tribulations but we in the midst of that what did Paul, Peter said don't consider it strange don't consider it don't be surprised when there's a fiery trial that comes upon you as a Christian don't be surprised that you experience sufferings and tribulations and what we're going through now it's not persecution it, it, people who are not vaccinated and they're not allowed into the mile they're not being persecuted that's not what persecution is, according to the definition that I showed you. Not Christian persecution. But all of it can be a preparation, like a rehearsal for what is to come. And we have to learn the right attitude in the midst of it. So we must understand, don't consider it strange. Don't be upset when you go through various sufferings because you're a Christian. It's part of the normal Christian lifestyle. Matthew 16, 24 to 25 talks about us dying to ourselves, picking up our cross and following him. The cross is a symbol of persecution. It was the, the Romans' method of persecuting those people that were, went against the Roman government. Jesus was crucified on a cross. So for us to pick up a cross means that we are to be willing to go through persecution for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. According to the New Testament, we must suffer persecution. If we do not suffer some kind of persecution, we are probably not living for God's glory. If we love God, the world will hate us. Worldly men will always oppose righteous men. That's from the Applied New Testament commentary. So not only is persecution a given, persecution is of the godly. And it's for doing the right thing. So persecution is not suffering because we have done wrong. It's not because we have, done, we have sinned, therefore there's a certain curse that has come into our life and we are suffering for that. It's not because we have broken the law and we are suffering the just consequences of that. It's because we have done what's right. We have loved God and we've just in peace shared the joy that is in our hearts with others, and persecution will come. So persecution is for righteousness' sake, as we read. So we must only suffer persecution for the sake of Christ. That's for righteousness. In other words, for doing what is right, and for no other reason. In, uh, here in 1 Peter 3, 14. In fact, if you want to read more about 
the teaching of scripture on how to go through persecution, read 1 Peter. That's Peter's, when, when Peter was an older man, he'd been through a lot of persecution himself. In fact, Peter in the end was crucified upside down in Rome. And in the end of his life, he wrote these little letters, 1 Peter, 2 Peter. And in 1 Peter, it's all about him teaching the church how to go through persecution. The attitudes, the way we go through persecution, to expect persecution, and what do you do in the midst of persecution. So after this message, I encourage you, read 1 Peter. It's all about how to go through persecution. Men are persecuted for many reasons, such as sin, foolishness, bad habits, but only those who are persecuted because of righteousness are blessed, according to this passage of Scripture. If you want to be truly blessed, don't be persecuted because of your own foolishness. There are some Christians who uh, just get on people's nerves. And it's not because of the offense of the cross. In fact, that's what Paul said. The only offense that we should be to other people is the offense of the cross. That's the gospel message. But if there's other offenses, because, we're, because of our bad habits, because we're, we're very rude, and I've seen Christians like that, <laughs> and they just offend others, not because of, with the message of Christ, but because of their character. And then they suffer and they say, I'm being persecuted. No, that's not the case. It's like some of the churches in America when they were not, not listening to the government to close down the churches. And as I said in my last message, I don't believe that's persecution because the intent of the government was for health, for health reasons, to protect the people. And yet these people, these Christians thought, you know, I have a right, we have rights to worship God in the church. And so they rose up and there was a legal, the law courts came against them. Of course, they were acquitted in the end, but they went through unnecessary suffering. I don't believe that suffering was persecution. Persecution is where it's really, you're doing the right thing. You're just standing up, you love Christ and you're sharing him. And the spirit of Antichrist can't take it and starts to, per to persecute you. Sometimes we bring trouble on ourselves unnecessarily. We think we are righteous but in fact, we are suffering because of our mistakes or our lack of knowledge. Let us be certain that what we are doing will bring honor to God. Only if we suffer for bringing honor to God, then we will be blessed. Amen? And this is something to ask yourself in your Christian life. Are you having some form of persecution? If you are a Christian and you're really sharing your faith with others, there will be those that will come against you. And that is normal. If you're a Christian and you're not having any persecution, you must think, well, that means I'm not really being salt and light in this world. I'm not sharing my faith. I'm not shining forth who Christ is. And ask the Lord to help you, to strengthen you, to, do, to share forth who he, he is in the world. And you will get persecution, but you'll be blessed. You'll be happier, be more joyful in the midst of it. And God will protect you if it's his will for you to die. And I believe there's an appointed time to die. If it's his will and he wants to promote you to glory in a fast way <laughs> through martyrdom, then praise the Lord. God will give you the grace. I believe that God will give grace when the time comes. And you, you hear many testimonies of how people have the grace of God. And that brings us to the final point, point that persecution always leads to God's glory. So persecution for Christians, for God, people wanting to live godly, is a given. It will happen. But it only happens as we are living godly lives. It's not because of our, our sin or the wrong actions that we do. But if we do perse be persecuted for righteousness sake, we will give glory to God. His word will grow. People will come to the Lord through our testimony. Remember what I said, that martyrio, the word witness, is where we get the word martyr from. So persecution will lead to a revelation of God's glory. There's a Christian church leader, early church leader. They refused to call him a church father because uh, there were some issues in his life. Tertullian. Tertullian uh, actually 
in the end of his life, he went and got involved in what's called the Montanist movement, which is a prophetic movement. And as I look at them, actually, they're, they're a bit like the charismatic Pentecostals of today. <laughs> uh, so some people don't accept him as a church father. But I, I look back and I see Tertullian as a really a man of God. And he also experienced persecution and he saw persecution in his lifetime. And what's quoted to him, or to what, what people say is, what he said is, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. That's not actually what he said. Let me read to you the exact words that he wrote down. An early Christian leader called Tertullian, who lived from 164 to 200 AD, declared, kill us, torture us, condemn us, grind us to dust. The more you mow us down, the more we grow. For the seed of the church is the blood of the Christians. Every single drop of our blood springs up in some, in some 30, in some 60, in some 100 fold. That's what he said. <laughs> Quite in your face is what he said. What he said was, you know, kill us, torture us, condemn us, grind us to the dust. He was not afraid of persecution. And in the early church, you saw that through the martyrs of those that were willing to stand firm in Christ, actually the church grew and grew and grew. So the, that's why it's refined now to the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. But that's not exactly what he said. 1 Peter 4, 14 to 16. If you are ridiculed for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Amen? So if you've become a Christian and someone in your family is ridiculing you, praise the Lord. You're blessed. You're happy. Amen? You can rejoice because God sees you worthy. For the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and God rests on you. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he should not be ashamed, but should glorify God in having that name. So twice here, the word glory, 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 glory. Persecution brings glory to the Lord. In scripture, there's a theme of suffering always leads to glory. True suffering in the Lord always leads to glory. As we join in the sufferings of Christ, Christ himself was persecuted. And as we share the good news of the Lord in our families, in our friends, in our workplaces, in the right way, not in a way that our, our character is getting in the way, but we're just praying and we're loving the people there. There will be those that rise up in opposition. But what we have to do is rejoice because we are blessed and we know that we have a greater reward waiting for us in the heavens. There's another Christian leader whose testimony is written down. He was a bit earlier than Tertullian. He's called Polycarp. And how many have heard of Smyrna? Smyrna is the second church in Revelation. And Smyrna was a church that Jesus spoke to because they were going through persecution. He didn't say anything negative about this church. He was encouraging them, helping them to go through that time of persecution. Later, there was a bishop that rose up in Smyrna called Polycarp. And he was killed for his faith. He, he was exiled a time from Smyrna. When he came back, the Romans took him and they burnt him at the stake. And as he was dying, this is the record of what he said. He said, 80 and six years have I served Christ, nor has he ever done me any harm. How then could I blaspheme my king who saved me? I bless thee for deigning me worthy of this day and this hour that I may be among thy martyrs to drink the cup of my Lord Jesus Christ. And that's not the only testimony. You, you can get the book called the Fox's Book of Martyrs. And it lists testimony after testimony of the early church Christians who died in such ways and the things that they said as they were dying. They were obviously caught up in the presence of God. Praising him, worshipping him, glorifying his name, entering into the glory of God, entering into the full glory of his presence and receiving his fullness of rewards. In the early church, you see the same thing. Acts 5.11, it talks about how after the apostles had been beaten for sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, 
They departed from the presence of the council, that's the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council, rejoicing that they were worthy to suffer shame for his name. (laughs) Isn't that amazing? They were suffering shame, they were being beaten up, and what were they doing? Rejoicing. That brings us to the greater P word. Okay, we've heard what the P word is, persecution, but the greater P word is praise. Amen? If we want to prepare ourselves for persecution, we need to become a people of praise. Learn to praise him in every situation. James said, consider it pure joy when you go through fiery tribulations. Okay, so yes, this time of pandemic may not be a persecution per se, but it is a suffering. With your non-Christian friends, what do you say? say, Oh no, there's more, more restrictions. Complaint after complaint after complaint. Or do you say, hallelujah, I rejoice in my God. I can have more time in his presence. <laughs> I rejoice. I thank God. I'm, and you show that joy in your life. That's a testimony. Amen? And of course, there are those that are, are going to rile against that, have the spirit of Antichrist and put on more persecution. And then that should produce more rejoicing. So learn to praise him through the trials. Consider it great joy. This will prepare us for greater persecutions in the end time. Also, learn to pray in his presence. Hebrews 13 verse 3 talks about, remember those who are imprisoned for their faith. So those that have, we may not have people here in Singapore who are being persecuted on the severe levels but there are people around the, around the world who are suffering. Pastor Ong was telling me in Myanmar, there's one Christian put in prison. And what, what can we do? Hebrews 13.3 says, Pray for these as though you are chained with them in prison. As though you are suffering with them. That's what at the prayer altar we can do. At the prayer altar, it's interesting actually that in Revelation uh, 6 9, where it talks about the opening of the seals. The fifth seal is opened up, and John sees martyrs, thousands, thousands, thousands of martyrs. Where are they? In heaven. The souls of the martyrs he sees. And where are, where are their souls? At the base of the altar. To me, that tells me two things. Firstly, it tells me that those who are, that are martyred in the end times for Christ's name. They will be sacrifices, living sacrifices. That's why they're at the base of the altar. They've given their life as a living sacrifice, which is acceptable worship to the Lord. But also, they've been such at home at the altar in the heavenly throne room that that's where they end up. Their souls are there because they've been, they've been there on earth. I've been there. I've been in the throne room at the base of the altar praying seeking the face of the Lord, crying out to him. That's what the prayer altar is all about. And as you pray for others, you intercede, especially we can intercede for those who are suffering in the other countries who are going through persecutions. It actually says we are there with them. And so the Holy Spirit comes and brings us an understanding of what it even means to go into prison with people who are suffering for the name of Christ. There's a grace that comes as we intercede in prayer. So as we praise, as we pray, it's preparing us, even if we have to go through such severe times of persecution. And I pray that we do not have to. But that is what we can do. We can praise, we can pray, we can seek the face of the Lord. So that this is the New New Living Translation version of the end of that beatitude. Let's read it together. Be happy about it. About what? Persecution. Be very glad, for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. Amen? So in Revelation 6, you see that fifth seal opening up, the martyrs there at the base of the altar. Matthew 7, uh, Revelation 7, verse 9 again, it talks about, the great multitude from every tongue, tribe, and nation before the throne of God with palm branches wearing the white robes. Who were they? 
I used to think, ah, I used to love having that picture of me being part of that great group before the throne, waving the palm branches, tongue, every tongue, every tribe, every nation, hallelujah. But then when John asked the elder who they were, who did John say? Oh, these are the ones that have come out of the great tribulation. <laughs> so if you want to be a part of that great multitude before the throne of God, waving the palm branches, you must be willing to go through persecution. And to be going through persecution means you're sold out for the Lord. It means you're, you just want to share Jesus in your life, wherever you go. You want to just share the good news. You want to share his peace. You want to be a peacemaker wherever you go and share the good news of the gospel. And most will receive, but there are going to be those that persecute. In the, in the midst of persecution, what do we do? Praise him. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet. And let's ask the Lord to give us the strength to be those people. Yes, we don't chase after persecution, but according to the scripture, those that desire to live godly lives will suffer persecution. And we will have to suffer some kind of persecution, rejection from even family members. But in the midst of it, we are blessed. Amen. There's a joy that will come upon us. Not only that, we can praise him more and more and more. Ask the Lord to release a spirit of praise in your hearts right now. Let's sing that song. Uh, I sing praises to your name. And as we sing this song, let's ask the Lord to release a greater praise in us. Yes, Lord, forgive us. Forgive us, Lord Jesus, where many times we don't want to suffer. And it's okay to not want to suffer. But when we do go through suffering, we complain. Instead of seeing the bigger picture of what's happening. Help us, Lord, to be ready. Because we know that in the end times there will be greater persecution. And help us to have a vision of what you say in your word that those who desire to live godly life will suffer persecution. And I thank you, Lord, that as we do, and from my own experience, yes, I've not experienced the severe persecution, but I know that I can rejoice knowing that I have been considered worthy to be reviled by men and women of the world who, who are, instead of rejoicing who you are there, throwing stones at you. They're the ones who have crucified you to the cross. But I also know that I was part of that group before I was a believer. My sin crucified you to the cross. So Lord, help me to rise up in love and hope and faith. Help me to be as you say, Lord, those seven attitudes, so I can reach out in mercy to a dying world, so I can reach out with your peace, with the message of you, Jesus, the Prince of Peace. And no matter what the world throws at me, I can rejoice knowing that I love you and I serve you above all else. You are my King. You are my Lord. Oh, yes, Lord. I pray for each one of us here, Lord. Increase our love for you. Increase our desire to serve you, no matter what the cost, Lord God. Help us, Lord, to say, I am a living sacrifice. Oh, which is the acceptable worship unto you, Lord God. Let me offer my body as a living sacrifice to you, Lord Jesus. Oh, yes, and if I have to lay it down as a martyr, then I want to lay down my life. I want to be like that girl who, who instead of trampling over your cross, instead fell down on her knees and worshipped you. Let me praise you. Let me be a person of praise all the days of my life and that Lord you'll be glorified and you'll be glorified by many people coming to know you because I choose to shine forth your love and your mercy and your grace in the name of Jesus let's sing this final song I sing praises to your Let's lift up our hands. Say, make me a person of praise, Lord. Even in troubled times, even in suffering, I praise you. 
just praise him right now. Yes, your name is great. Greatly to be praised. Yes, say that to the Lord. I sing praise, yes, through every situation, Lord. Make me a person of praise, Lord God. Person of praise in every situation, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. Oh, let praise arise, Lord, in my heart right now, Lord. Oh, let praise arise in everyone's heart here, Lord. Those at home that are watching. Oh, over YouTube, Lord, right now, let praise, Lord, rise. Let praise rise in our hearts. Even in the suffering, even in the difficult times, even in the tough times, Lord, we praise you because you're worthy of all praise. Worthy of all honor, worthy of all glory, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to your name. Yes, Lord. That's all about giving you glory, Lord Jesus. Glory to your holy name. Your name is great. Yes, Lord. Greatly to be praised. Yes, one last time. I sing praises. Yes, Lord. As I sing praises, I give you glory, Lord God. Oh, as I praise you in the tough times, Lord, you are glorified, Lord Jesus. Be glorified through me in my family, Lord Jesus. Be glorified through me, Lord, in my workplace, Lord. Let me shine forth for your glory, Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord, I give glory to your name. Today we want to offer ourselves a living sacrifice. Let me be a vessel of praise in every situation, Lord. Yes, Lord. Even if I have to suffer for your name's sake, let it be for no other reason, Lord. I want to love you and follow you no matter what the cost, because you are worthy, and you are worthy of all glory and honor and power and praise. So, Lord, I praise you. Let my life be a life of praise to your name every moment of the day in the mighty name of Jesus and all the people of God said Amen. Amen. Lift up your hands for the Lord's blessing. Hallelujah. We read in the Beatitudes that blessed, 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 blessed as you do these things He's going to bless. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you his shalom peace in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Okay, please, the two outer rows B. We have come to the end of our service. Thank you for watching. I'm Gary, and I'd like to welcome you to COSBT. If you're joining us for service for the very first time, we would love to get to know you better. So do connect with us here and feel free to share with us if you have any questions, comments, and even prayer requests. We would love to pray alongside with you. Also, be sure to hit that subscribe button so that you won't miss out on our weekly sermons. Stay updated on the latest church announcements by following our Facebook and Instagram. Blessing you with a wonderful week ahead. Shalom.